I have been alarmed by the increasingly rash actions of Madhu, recently telling a high government official that he is turning into Swami, which the official thought was absurd, and telling his followers to give up the physical form of Swami, a blatant sacrilege. This post focuses on how easily misguided gullible devotees can be to blindly follow foolish information that Madhu receives from an invisible Swami. In this post, I'll describe how easy it is for humans to be fooled by their own subconscious mind, by paranormal phenomena, by charismatic figures, by foolhardy projects, yes, fooled even by the Madhu Mudanhali movement. Persuasive, even paranormal events can occur that seem true only to be found false. For instance, I know in detail of an ill devotee who received materialized messages signed Sai Baba, who followed the instructions meticulously, initially leading to a cure, but later found to be disruptive and false. Yes, miraculous events that lead us astray can happen. In my book, With Love Man is God, I have documented a case in which knowledgeable educators trained in a special communication technique with autistic children were badly fooled, resulting in the disruption of families. Multiple communicators in different unrelated locations, independently and without knowing the result of others, heard similar stories through their special technique, that the children were being abused, resulting in the children being taken from their parents. After rigorous scientific analysis of the facts, the communicators were found to be fooled. We can be fooled by the deceptive power of the subconscious mind with its capacity to access extraordinary and detailed information that can be used to mislead. We can be fooled by strong charismatic personalities or by paranormal phenomena or lured by superstition and wishful thinking. And we can be influenced by dark forces in others or in our own selves. Yes, even the Madhu Mudanhali event that has persuaded so many well-meaning and loving devotees can mislead. Magicians also fool us by performing seemingly amazing feats that defy natural laws, by hiding what they are actually doing out of sight. History is replete with examples of attractive movements wielding their deception out of sight and behind a curtain. One can be fooled by the numbers, thinking that so many well-known and well-meaning devotees follow the Madhu Mudanhali movement. How could so many be wrong? What's important is quality, not quantity. Numbers don't matter. Like the story about Krishna offering the Kauravas and Pandavas either a large army or himself, but only as a charioteer. And the Kauravas wrongly chose the armies. The Pandavas rightly chose Krishna. My heart tells me that Madhu is truly channeling Swami, some say, because Madhu knows the unknowable, or because his talks are so much Swami-like, or something unusual happened when looking at Madhu, or some say that they feel a love that is convincing. But is it real selfless love, 
when resulting in the splitting of our organization and creating discord among devotees, we must have some humility about our ability to know or feel what or who is God. For instance, Swami has said, I am all deities in one. You may endeavor your best for thousands of years and have all mankind with you in your search, yet you cannot understand my reality. This is from the U.S. edition of Professor Castori's authorized biography, Satyam Shivam Sundaram, volume 3, page 315. Yet some in a naive, innocent state believe that they can tell such indefinable, inexpressible, inexplicable knowledge. Here is a former student relating how Swami told some students how little we know about his reality. Purely my grace and grace alone that each one of you souls have come to me. Not one of you in front of me deserve one second of being with Swami. Not one of you deserve. What it is, I am conferring a boon upon you, which is a billion times more than any of you deserve. Then, of course, he looked a little sad, and he says, not one of you are making even one millionth the best of it. With this understanding, how arrogant is our certainty that Swami is in a sukshma form that only Madhu can see and interpret. Swami took such care to proper appearance and all that appeared around him. Would he now be satisfied with his image being an empty chair and a young man receiving adoration that should be directed to Swami? With the young man walking like Swami, taking letters like Swami, riding in a chariot like Swami, signing forms like Swami, posing with devotees like Swami, even creating a lingam like Swami. Would Swami encourage such a representation of his image and teachings? We must take seriously our solemn duty to protect Sai's image and teachings against such sacrilege. Releasing frivolous names and forms and holding to the eternal wisdom of Sai brings unity. How powerful can the impulse of man be to want to become God? In order to have all power and adoration, in order to satisfy desires, I'm alarmed about Madhu playing God, saying that he is turning into Swami. He now wears okra robes and allows people to take Padnamaskar to take his photos, to receive letters, and adoration. Devotees say that Madhu can know secrets and deliver discourses like Sai Baba, discourses that I find watered down. These factors and his ability to draw devotees to him suggest that he might have a fearful city power. Although what Madhu is doing can still be explained as fakery, and for most devotees certainly sacrilege, many wonder if he has been taken over by a dark spiritual force, strong enough to even want to challenge God. A dark force that can influence the mind of man and draw us into terrible conflict, causing suffering and hatred seeing how frightening dark forces are in the world. Must we seriously awaken to the power and terrible threat to our safety and sanity of such forces and counter them? Following is an interview with Sanskrit scholar Professor 
Stanishwar Timalsina to discuss what the scriptures say about the power and influence of dark forces strong enough to challenge God, disrupting and splitting a Sangha, and turning devotees against each other. And how can we overcome this fearful reality? To welcome Prema Sai, who brings peace. Tanishwa Timbalsina, Professor, it's good to see you again. I'm glad we're having another conversation about a timely subject, somebody going into a synagogue and yeah. shooting up uh, Jewish uh, observance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, just a few days before, there was a bomber. Oh, uh, what's going on? So it's yeah. a timely subject. We'll, t we'll talk about how prevalent uh, the issue of the dark, dark elements, dark influences in society, on a person, in a, in a, on a civilization, on a community. How prevalent is it in spiritual literature? Uh, how prominent is it a really a central issue? Is this an important issue? Uh, how uh, this dark force manifests itself? Uh, it manifests itself in, in thoughts. It can be a buffalo. It can be a person. So we'll talk a little bit about and where that these uh, elements come from. Uh, Ravana even talked about being overwhelmed by some, uh, some impulse that was uh, difficult and very dark. How dangerous is this dark force? How strong is this dark force? Is it as strong as God himself? How do we defend against it? How do we counter it? Uh, how do we prepare ourselves? These are some of the subjects. So let's start with uh, subject number one. How prevalent is this issue of a dark element, not just in the mind of man, uh, influencing one person to another, but is the spiritual dim uh, dimension uh, is there an aspect of the spiritual dimension that is that can be evil, that can be dark, and can influence the physical dimension? I am thinking of the stories of how young Krishna and Rama fought and killed demons. Are there demonic forces in the spiritual dimension that can become so overpoweringly disruptive and destructive to our world community? Professor Timolcina begins by describing how humans can be influenced by dark forces from the spiritual dimension. You know, there's so much of a diversity that every culture has a unique uh, viewpoint, its own philosophy, its own belief system. One thing common Unequivocally, one thing common among all the belief systems is human is a vessel. Humans can soak like sponge. Humans can soak positive energy. Nowadays in, in pop culture, we say vibes, you know. We can, we can pick up some good vibes. Or, and humans can also be the vessels for the negative energies, they call dark forces. In the spiritual literature, what we find is mm, human is a, a, a field of energy and, and that field of energy has both sides, good side and bad side. Comment for clarification. The spiritual understanding from numerous cultures is that the human is a permeable, open vessel that can be influenced by not only the sensory material realm, but also the spiritual realm as well. We are setting the stage for an understanding that there are strong evil forces in the spiritual realm that can profoundly affect us, countered by our understanding about them and how to protect ourselves. And so we begin our interview with Professor Timulcina. More will come.
The messages say that Madhu Mudanhali is a fearful reality that must be countered. Just how dark is the Madhu Mudanhali force? In this post, Professor Timalsina describes what scriptures say about the ferocity of dark forces, how they camouflage to seem good, and how easy to fall under its spell. Unity of divine power is required to dispel the most terrible of dark forces. Here I make the point that dark forces from the spiritual dimension can manifest in the world like good forces from the spiritual dimension can manifest as seen in the case of my patient Jackie. And then Professor Timelsina begins with his story. We know that these subtle level, there is a subtle level and it can manifest. We know that. Mm -hmm. So are there stories of how strong this negative force can be? For instance, you were narrating about a buffalo. Can yeah. you just tell that story? And where does that come from? This story about the buffalo and how it is finally yeah. challenged and overcome. So the first thing of a buffalo demon story is there is this demon and then he takes control of the underworld. He becomes the king of the underworld and then he can change his form. He doesn't need to be a buffalo. Okay. He can change. He can take any form, human or lion or whatever form he likes to be. And, and then it's in the Devi Bhagavata, like in the Durga book, that the story comes from the Puranas. And so, but anyway, the story gives us the clue of what they believed in when they were talking about the dark force. So this dark force takes over human realm and the dark force takes over the realm of the gods. And the, in Hinduism, it's, it's kind of interesting that there are so many different gods. And so each god has its own, his own realm, like Yama and Indra and Mitra and Varuna, you know, all these, all these gods, Agni. So, so the, the, the Mahisha takes control and all the gods are sent in exile and they are hiding in different corners. They go up to the God of creation. You would think, oh my gosh, almighty. No, God of creation, Brahma says, you know what, my job is not to fight. My job is just to create. And so you have to go to Vishnu because he's the one who fights and maintains the world in order. And then Vishnu, uh, but this demon is too powerful for me. That is funny because Vishnu is supposed to be, you know, he incarnates whenever there's a, there is a, 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 a cataclysmic uh, events and he brings the harmony, he balances it. But even Vishnu says, no, I, I cannot uh, take care of this demon, too mighty for me. And then they go to Shiva and Shiva says, but he has my own persona. That just goes back to all the story. I can't kill him either, but I can teach you guys the clue. You know, he, he's like a wise man, kind of meditating guy. And I can teach you guys, like we have to split out our energies, forces. All the good has to be united. All the energies of each and every girl has to be distilled into one single location and one embodiment. And then they got Durga. So this Durga... And is, they call is, this united energy Durga. Yeah. Durga okay. means the energy. She is also Yama. She is also Indra. She is also Varuna. She is also Agni. She is also Vishnu and Rudra. And so, the, what is Durga could change into anything? Durga yes. is she is the free. collective. She is the collective presence of all the forces, right? Wow. And so now she kills the buffalo demon. She has to go to a battle. She kills the dark force. Why is this dark force so powerful that when the good is divided, good cannot take care. When the good is united, only then good can take care of the evil. So the, the, the way, bottom line is unity. The bottom line there. is the unity of the good forces and the, the unity of the dark forces because Maisha was able to unite all the dark forces. When it comes to extremism, that is when they pick up the dark force because they believe that killing somebody is going to do good. You know, that is, that is nothing more heinous than, than that. And make no mistake, 
the defiling of Swami's image, the splitting of his Sangha is a killing and must be countered. Unity of the good force is needed to overcome the unity of the dark force, a dark force that can have terrible power, that can camouflage as good, can deceive and influence and gather a following. We must counter with unity. More to come.